media theory people, and welcome to another one of my short lectures. Today I want to focus on our McLuhan reading, uh, which is a famous reading uh, that is uh, uh, all about uh, how the, the medium that we communicate through is uh, at base more uh, the study of that medium is, is more important than the study of, of the medium's content. So the idea here is that, uh, of course, you, you've heard this phrase, the medium is the message. So to give you a little background, this piece was written in 1964, and it was largely a response to an overwhelming focus on media content and its effects. So you may have heard of media effects research, and media effects research was very popular uh, in the late 40s and, and 1950s, and the people who, who studied it were really interested in how media content impacted audiences. And it was based in, in an idea that is somewhat problematic, and that idea is that, uh, I mean, this is a real oversimplification, but the idea really is that somehow uh, media can make people do things. Right, so uh, we've heard a fair amount of this recently. You know, if you watch too much Fox News, then that's why you went and stormed the Capitol on January the sixth, for example. And uh, any anyone today that's uh, a real media theorist knows that it it just isn't that simple, right? But uh, you have to remember that during the late forties and nineteen fifties, we were coming off of the Second World War, and that the Germans, the Nazis, were particularly good with with media uh, and, and disseminating propaganda through the media. And we were looking for a, a rationale or a, a reason why an entire nation was, was able to engage in, in truly uh, barbaric kinds of uh, activities. Uh, you know, the big question was, how did this happen? And, and a lot of people suggested it was through the, the Nazis uh, manipulation of the media. And, and so, you know, again, there, there was this tremendous focus on, on what do these messages do to people, right? And, and so this was sort of the idea of media effects. And uh, the idea was that media content could sort of inoculated people, that it acted as kind of a hypodermic needle. You know, you'd stab them with this ideological information uh, and inject it into them, and then they'd behave accordingly. So McLuhan's writing is, in some sense, a reaction to this, a response uh, to this uh, rather dominant line of research, and, and it, it made him a bit of a celebrity. Uh, he, he was a public intellectual. He was on TV and the radio, and uh, he, he was really quite popular for, for a while then. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you could see him here in uh, Woody Allen's Annie Hall, just kind of a funny clip. We saw the Fellini film last Tuesday. It is not one of his best. It lacks a cohesive structure. You, know, you get the feeling that he's not absolutely sure what it is he wants to say. Of course, I've always felt he was essentially a, a technical filmmaker. Granted, La Strada was a great film. Great in its use of negative imagery more than anything else. But that central cohesive core, you know, well, stop that must lead to an artist's work, leading from one to the Screaming other. Screaming his opinions in my ear. You know what I'm talking about? Like all that Juliet of the Spirits or Satyricon. I found it incredibly indulgent. You know, he really is. He's one of the most indulgent yeah. filmmakers. He really is. Keyword here and is without, indulgent. without getting, uh, let's put it this way. You depressed about it. I miss my therapy. I overslept. Possibly over the alarm clock. Do you know the hostile gesture that is to me? I know, because of our sexual problem, right? Everybody online at the New Yorker has to know our rate of intercourse. It's like Samuel Beckett. You know, I admire the technique, but it, it doesn't it doesn't hit me on a gut level. I'd like to and hit this guy on a gut that. level. Stop it, Albie. He's, he's spitting on my neck, you know, he spits on my neck. Thing 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 all is, uh, and you know something vision. else? You know, you're so egocentric that if I miss my therapy, you can only think of it in terms of how it affects you. Well done, Sean. That's what it is. It's probably on their it's first date, right? You probably met by answering an ad it. in the New York Review of Books. 30-ish academic wishes to meet woman who's interested in Mozart, James Joyce, and sodomy. What do you mean, our sexual problem? Okay. I mean, I'm comparatively normal for a guy raised in Brooklyn. Okay, I'm very sorry. My sexual problem. Okay, my sexual problem, huh? 
I never read that. That was that was uh, Henry James, right? Novel, you know the what sequel to Turn of the Screw. It's the Bisexual. influence of television. Now, now Marshall McLuhan deals with it in terms of it being a, a high. A, a high intensity, you understand? A hot medium, what I as opposed give for to a large sock as a horse manure. To tent, which he uses as what do you do when you get stuck on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Wait a minute, why can't it's I give my maddening. opinion? It's a free country. He, he, he can give you. Do you have to give it so loud? I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And and the funny part of it is, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really? work. Really, really, I happen to teach a class in Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan will have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so yeah. Just let me, let me, let me come over here a second. Oh, tell I her. Heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong? How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. So kind of funny, right? I, I like that clip for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that it skewers uh, our, our notions. Whoops, started it again. But it skewers our, our notions uh, of uh, intellectuals like myself, right? Uh, okay, so so what is McLuhan saying in, in this piece? Uh, McLuhan is admittedly difficult to read. Uh, his, his prose are dense and... Uh, I think purposefully uh, hard to negotiate. So despite the fact that he writes in this fancy way, McLuhan's main point is relatively simple. And, and his main point is that the media through which we communicate, if it's TV, radio, newspaper, or today social media, uh, you know, uh, websites and so on, that these things uh, create new industries, they create new ways of thinking, and perhaps most importantly, they create new ways of living. And so as a result, what we really need to be concerned about uh, is the medium that's being used to transmit communication and not the content of the messages being communicated. Now, I, personally, I think that this is an overstatement, but you, you have to remember again that this was a response to, to media effects studies that had dominated uh, the academy for, for at least a decade, uh, if not, not two. And uh, so, I mean, he was trying, he, he was really stating his point strongly. And, and I think it's a, it's, it's a worthwhile one to consider. And, and again, this is the idea that the medium, the thing that you're using to transmit the message, matters more than the content itself. So to get an idea of this, we could think about television, right? Uh, so television uh, is, sees its ascendancy or it rises in importance after World War II, uh, so around the, the same period of time that McLuhan was thinking. And while it does this, it creates a, a whole new industry with thousands of jobs. And it changed the way that people lived. And when I say it changed the way people lived, I mean it, it, it changed the way people lived in, an, in a way that I think is uh, one that's often overlooked. And that's how they live in a day-to-day -day kind of way, right? Because... You know, oftentimes when we, when we think of life, if you go to your photo book and you, you look through your photo albums, you know, you have these pictures of life events, your wedding, the birth of your first child, your graduation, right? All these, all these different things. But the, the truth is, is that those things don't really represent your life per se. You know, you spend a lot more time in the classroom and studying and writing papers than, than you do graduating, Right? Um, so, in a sense, life is what's lived between these moments that we like to think are really important and life-changing events. Um, and we don't put enough emphasis, I think, sometimes on our, on our day-to-day lived experience, what, what uh, you know, our quotidian, uh, you know, lives, to use a fancy term. So, so when we think about TV in that way, McLuhan's point really becomes uh, clear, right? I mean, TV changes family relations, for example, in, in, in ways that no one really anticipated. You can think about your own family here and probably see what I mean. Uh, the, the power relations within the family. Who controls the remote control? Who controls the TV? Do you, do you have spots that you like to sit in when you watch TV? What happens if you sit in dad's spot or in mom's spot? Right. I mean, all these things are, are complicated and they're all examples of, uh, 
you, you know, a, a hierarchical system to a certain extent. It changed what people did for entertainment. So when the TV comes out, the people in Hollywood that are making movies are really challenged by this and really worried about a drop-off in theater attendance. And of course, uh, we, we're in another crisis with that right now, where the pandemic changed the way that people took in films, how they took in movies. It changed what rooms you sat in in your house, right? You sat in, instead of, you know, sitting in the, in the parlor uh, with someone playing piano, which is what a lot of people did for, for entertainment prior to this, or, you know, they sat in the living room and, and watched the TV or the TV room. Right? It changed the way people got their news, the way they stayed informed about their communities and, and about their country, about their world. Right? It changed what people talked about, particularly back in the day of, of broadcast, you know, network dominance, where there were only three major networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and so chances are, if you were watching TV that night, which most Americans were, if you were watching TV, then, you know, there was a 33.3% chance that you're watching the same thing as your buddy at work. And then you could go in and talk about these things together, right? It, it, it changed how they got their entertainment. It was delivered to you, right? It was, it, was, it was broadcast into your home. You didn't have to go to the movie theater to a communal space where you had to sit with other people of varying classes and uh, economic and, and uh, you know, educational backgrounds. It changed what we thought about the value of entertainment because in, in a sense, it was free. So, you know, all these, all these things changed the way people lived and how they thought about things that impacted their daily lives in a really significant way that when we look at it from a meadow level, if we look at it, you know, stepping back from it and looking at the, the way that media and, and culture interface, we can say, I think, with a fair amount of confidence that the medium of television is more important than any particular show in terms of impacting the way people live and experience life on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the idea behind his, his famous saying, which is, the medium is the message. And, and again, he's, he's not interested so much in ideology or about the lessons that are taught within the content of the programming. He's interested, as this quote says, in the scale and form of human association and action. And what is human association and action? I mean, it's, that's the way people live. And he goes on to say, look, the content or uses of such media are as diverse as they are ineffectual in shaping the form of human association. So what he's doing here is he's discounting the content. He's saying, listen, the content isn't important. It's, it's the medium and the way we interact with it. This is why he goes on uh, in the early part of the article, for example, about the light bulb. Now, traditionally, you wouldn't think of the light bulb as a, as a medium or as a form of communication. But, you know, he's using it as an example, and to some extent you can argue that it is a form of communication, or at least that it enables communication. And, and then uh, look at all the ways the light bulb changed people's lives, again, on that day-to-day -day basis, on their ability to, to stay up later, to change their hours, to engage in different activities after it gets dark outside. Uh, change the way that they communicate with one another within the context of different parts of the day. I, I mean, it's he makes a valid point there. So, again, according to what he's saying here, the content, the programming, the, the information that's being sent doesn't matter much. And, in fact, sometimes that content can blind us or misdirect us away from the study of the thing that matters the most, which is the medium. And I think this is interesting and something you might want to think about, something that I thought about when reading this, is, you know, today people seem to have, uh, parents in particular, have a big problem with kids and tablet time. How much time does my kid spend on their gadget, on their device, on their iPad? And I've always wondered about this. Uh, it's, it's always struck me as an odd idea that you'd be worried that your child is on a on a tablet, and they call it tablet time, and I thought, well, a tablet can do so many different things. So, I mean, are you worried if your kid's on the tablet reading, uh, you know, a, a classic book? You know, 
using it like a Kindle and, and, and reading classic literature? Uh, probably not. Are, are you worried if your kid is on the tablet and doing his or her math homework? Again, probably not. So what is, you know, what is tablet time, right? This, this, you know, or being on your tablet. You know, even pediatricians have, have recently weighed in on this whole thing and said, well, you know, we need to cut down on the amount of time kids spend on these things. Well, but I mean, the point is, spent, you know, spent doing what it would be my, my question. And then I realized, to a certain extent, their message, the message that these folks are sending, uh, is better understood in terms of McLuhan's message. What they're, what they're saying, even though they don't realize they're saying it, is that the medium is the message, and that the problem isn't what the kids are doing on the device. The problem is the device, is what they're saying. Again, they don't, you know, if you, if you talk to a, a parent, most parents haven't thought this through, obviously. Uh, most people don't think most things through. Uh, but, you know, if you talk to a parent and you say, uh, you know, what, what is this tablet time? What are you worried that they're doing? They, they really can't articulate it. And that's because they're worried about, and they don't realize they're worried about, the medium. They're worried about the tablet. They're worried about the way the kid interacts with the tablet, about what it does to them in terms of human association and action. I see it in my own family. I see it in my wife who gets upset if the family's watching a movie and one of the kids picks up their tablet and starts to use it. Now, what she's worried about isn't really what they're doing on the tablet. What she's worried about is the fact that it's taking them out of this uh, communal group family experience and they're not sharing in it in the same way. That's the worry. It doesn't have anything to do with media content. It has to do with the device that's being used. So to further his argument, what, what uh, McLuhan does here is he, he compares media to natural resources. And he says, listen, if you don't think this is important, if you don't believe my argument, think about a society that's dependent on one or two major staples, like cotton, grain, lumber, fish, cattle, right? Any, any of these things. And he says, listen, if you have a society that's dependent on cotton, for example, uh, then you're going to have obvious social patterns of organization that result from this dependence. That society is going to be organized around this thing, organized around cotton or around grain or lumber. And, and that the, the society is going to change as a result. And, and so he says, uh, you know, that we can think of TV or radio in much the same way as cotton and oil, right? These things uh, become fixed charges on the entire psychic life of the community. And th then this, in turn, creates the unique cultural flavor of any society. So what he's saying is, if we build a society around these media forms, like TV, uh, the internet, social media, that it's going to impact our society, that it's going to impart a kind of cultural flavor to it. And, you know, arguably in, in today's world where we have people that are very uh, antagonistic towards each other on either end of the political spectrum, for example, uh, it, it's not surprising that we see this and that this becomes part of the cultural flavor of our society because it's generated through the medium, right? This um, a very solitary, in a sense, kind of medium where we engage with uh, social media uh, on our own, right? That it doesn't focus on community or togetherness or social interaction in a lived way. Um, so I, you know, I suppose maybe you could see his point. I hope this shed a little light on, on the uh, article and I, I appreciate you checking out my video. Thanks.